Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. You know, my wife and I were talking and reminiscing and reflecting on the fact that we've been married for nearly half a century. She says, but as we were talking, she said that, you know, actually it's been over 50 years if we count the time that we were dating, that we have been getting to know each other. And I, I was prompted to try to tell her how I made 49 years. I couldn't... I couldn't speak for her, I, I could only speak for myself. And so what I told her is what I will tell you, is that being married to Glenna is not what I do, it's who I am. Amen. So I don't have to think about how I'm supposed to to treat her. All I have to do is be myself. You see, over time, God took a wretched creature, a despicable individual, at times treacherous, at times ungrateful, at, at times unlawful, and he began a process in me, and that he was helping me to understand that even though the image of God in me had been tarnished, that we had another goal, and that was to be transformed into the image of Christ, day by day. You don't get there overnight. And in fact, you don't get there completely ever. We, we talked about the fact that even now, we are still in our feelings. And, and she mentioned just last night, she was in her feelings. But, but see, the thing about being in your feelings is, is that your feelings don't impact the relationship. How in the world could I allow my feelings to trash 49 years of God's goodness and mercy and kindness toward me. And so, so don't compare us to you. Don't compare our marriage to your marriage. You can't have our marriage. Okay, marriages don't come off the shelf and you just implement them. You have to sweat them out. You have to spend years despising each other until God changes you. You have to understand that, that this song that the choir sang, it could have been me. I have seen my friends, I have seen my family walk away from their commitment. And I can tell you there were times when I wanted to walk away from mine, but kept, kept. If you allow him to control your life, Amen. Festus, Feltus, you'll never leave. Amen. You, you're, you're, just, you're just a week or two in. <laughs> but you'll never leave. I, 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 there were people who posted on my Facebook who have been 40 plus years in this thing. And if you talk to them individually, they will tell you, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I want to thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for me. And I want you to know, Amity, God is here. I don't know what he intends for us to be, but if you will let him into your life, if you will allow him to fill you to overflowing with his presence, if you will allow him 
to rid you of your unforgiveness, if you will allow him to rid you of your habits, he will transform you and every relationship that you're in. I know what I'm talking about now. It could have been me. It could have been me. But God is good. God is good. So, so I, um, we have changed this sermon about three or four times this morning, and I, I, I decided to leave my iPad in my briefcase and just chat with you a little bit. So I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17, and this is a continuation. You know, I feel, I feel like church today. I, I, it, it's... it's Yes. So, for, so I'm going to read uh, all these verses, and, 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 so I'm going, and I'm going to be looking back on some things, and, and, and we're going to do this together. So 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. If you're there, please say amen. And it's okay, the, the air ain't working real good, so if you ain't got a fan, get one, because oh, we... Old time church, we just got a fan and we just kept fanning, you know, and wiping with the handkerchief. And so, hey, that's where we are today. And so we, you know, and brothers, y'all got water up here? So that's all I need. Okay. First Kings chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. And I'm reading into your hearing from the New American Standard Bible. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And that as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go, do as I have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward you may make one for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. I want you to look at your neighbor on the left and on the right. And I want you to say, neighbor, you can praise God from a dry place. I want to talk about praising God from a dry place. Praising God from a dry place. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and mercy and your kindness toward us. And, and we pray that you would superintend everything that we do and say here today. 
We know that you're able to do more than we could ever ask or think. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take your seats. I think that in the church of Jesus Christ, we rapidly lose sight of the fact that as much as we are involved, what God is doing is not always about us. You see, what's at stake is God's glory. And the real issue is how do we respond to a revelation of God's glory? In 1987, Lauren L. Harris um, did a song. Some of you may remember, but the song was entitled, I Miss My Time With You. And, and this was a song that was written from the heart of God. And basically the message of the song is, you are so busy serving me that you don't have time to love on me. You are so busy trying to do what you think I want, and all I want is time with you. And one of the things that we're going to have to be careful about here at Amity is that we have a few stewards who are serving and a lot of you who are not. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not throwing off on you, I'm just speaking the truth. And, and if that's the way it's going to be, then we're going to burn some people out. And what we're going to have is a situation where if we had two or three times the children's ministry workers, then those who work in the spring and the fall, and the fall could stand down and then the summer crew come in. But we don't have a summer crew. And so the children are with us. That's not a bad thing. It's just the truth. And what you have to understand is that God wants your service, but he wants you more. And that God will go to great lengths to get your attention. Sometimes it's a hospital stay. Sometimes God will drain your resources. Sometimes God will turn your spouse into a till of the hun. Or the hun is. But God is trying to say, you need me, and I need you. Let, let, me, let me share a passage with you that, that's exemplary of this. And when I read it, it, it just blew me away. It's from Jeremiah chapter 2, so take a minute and turn there. One of, the, one of the things I'm accused of is going way too fast. And so, you know, if y'all got somewhere to go, um, y'all might have to go today. Um, but we're not really in a hurry. And, and so I want you to, to pay attention. Listen, these, this is the words of Jeremiah, but he's speaking the heart of God. He says, now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus says the Lord, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals, your following after me in the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his harvest. All who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty? In other words, God said that was a time in your life when I didn't have to beg you to come to me. That was a time in your life when coming to me was as natural as breathing. As my wife and I drove here this morning, we saw people riding their bicycles. We saw people in the park walking, enjoying God's nature. But, but what you find out is that people want the provision, but they don't want the provider. 
You see, everybody wants to be blessed. There are so many women who want good husbands who don't realize that getting a good husband begins with being a good wife. Ooh, I wish I had someone praying. Ask 1 Peter 3, even if he's hard-headed, even if he's knuckle-headed, even if he's a jerk. then you minister to him. Don't bang him over the head with the book. Don't tell him you don't never come to church. You just keep coming to church and being sweet when you go home. Just cook some neck bones and some pot rolls and say, come on in here, honey. I'm going to take care of you like you have never been taken care of before. And then as the sun sets, you finish the job. I'm just saying. I remember, God says, I remember when you were devoted to me. Do you remember, you remember our program, those of you who grew up like I grew up? Okay, we, did, we didn't know anything about uh, anything other than playing in the street. And we didn't have to have equipment. We had, we had a broomstick and a tennis ball. Okay. <laughs> And, and that when we needed a roller toy, we took the, can, the, the lid from a lard can and nailed it to the end of a stick and rolled. <laughs> and then when you really wanted the roll, you took an old tire. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and life was good. And we respected our parents. And we went to church because we didn't, we didn't play golf on Sunday. We, we didn't go boating on Sunday. We, we, we didn't even have a boat. We went down to the creek. And now we are boating. Now we have a jet ski. Now we have devices, but we don't have him. And so I think God had a servant who was so busy serving that he actually put him through a regimen that says, I miss my time with you. And so he put him in a situation. The very first, let's look at 1 Kings 17, verse 1. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, stop. Prior to this, we know nothing about Elijah. We do know that he was a mountain man. We do know he was a man of faith. We do know he was a man of prayer. But we didn't know anything about Elijah the Tishbe, Tishbite. He just comes on the scene. What does that mean? God, you don't have to be known for God to use you. You don't have to be a celebrity. So God picked Elijah, and then he pitted him against Ahab. He says, now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, who is Ahab, son of Omri, one of the baddest dudes on the planet. He married Jezebel. I'm going to tell you, if you marry down, <laughs> don't shout me down. He married Jezebel. I don't even have to say anymore. If you're going to marry Jesse... I forgot maybe people named their children that, and so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm moving on. He married Jezebel, and that says everything. Then he says, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So why did he do that? First of all, he was a Baal worshiper. Baal was the god of nature and fertility, and so this was intended to be a direct repudiation of Ahab and his God. He said, you want to know who God is? My God can shut up the skies and no rain will come until I say it's going to come. And he said that to Ahab's face. He says, 
You're not getting no rain. But then it was time to get out of Dodge. Okay, so God said, you can't hang around with Ahab because Ahab has friends. And, and, and Jezebel will put a contract out on you. So God says, I want you to go to the brook Kerith. I want you to stay there. So God is sending Elijah to a dry place. Now, how do we know that it's a dry place? First of all, because it's the brook. Now, in the Hebrew, brook is actually wadi. So he was sending him to a ditch that only held water when it rained. Now, what does that mean? That means God was sending his main man, Elijah, to a place where he knew it was the brook was going to dry up. Some of you are asking, why am I here? Why am I in this place? Why did God allow me to come to a place that looked so good in the beginning and now my brook has dried up? Uh, it may be that God is trying to say, don't depend on the brook. Maybe God is trying to say, I'm God over dry places just like I am over those that are green. But see, one of the problems is if we're not close enough to him, one of the things that, that uh, we celebrated our 49th anniversary by driving to Shreveport to be with a family, um, members of this church that had lost a loved one. So we took our special day to go be nourishment to someone else. But it was actually nourishment to us because 49 years earlier, that's where we were on the road. We had, our, we, we, our wedding was a Sunday wedding, and, um, and it was on a Sunday because my mother said, if it's on Saturday, I'm not coming, okay? <laughs> that she, wasn't, she wasn't being mad, mean or nothing. She was a barber, okay? And Saturday was her big day. Anybody in here who's a barber knows that Saturday is the day that she says, I need my money. She said, so you put it on Sunday. So she was there, and it was wonderful. And we had our little party, and the first thing we did is packed our car with all our little presents, and, you know, and it was just a room enough for my wife and me in a bucket seat, she on one side, me on the other side, and we're driving from Mobile to Grambling, where we spent our honeymoon at the Grambling Motel. <laughs> Don't shout me down now. What am I, and, and, and where were we on 49, on I-20, headed to Shreveport? I think that the most favorite thing that we have that we do is road trips. And the, pro the thing is that my wife knows me. She knows my driving habits. And so when she gets in the car, we recline. And then everything goes silent. <laughs> and that's the way we have rolled for 49 years. You have to understand that when God knows you and you know him, you can be comfortable in any situation. You can fall asleep at night while the storm is going on. You can actually fall asleep knowing that you don't know how to pay the bill that's coming in the morning. You can actually fall asleep when you have no idea where your next job is coming from because you know the provider. You don't have to worry about the provision. So, I have three points for you, and the first one is this. We can praise God in a dry place if we know that our pain has a purpose. We can pl praise God in a dry place when we know that our pain has a purpose. God will never send you to a dry place if he does not already have a plan and a purpose for you. God knew that the brook was going to dry up. God knew the situation that you are in, you are going to be in. But God never, God's 
providence never takes us to a place where his grace cannot keep us. He already had something in mind for Elijah. He says, just go. So, so God says, go to the brook Kareth, he goes. He says, now I'm going to have some birds feed you. I'm going to get doves. I'm going to get eagles, all these clean birds. No, he didn't do that. He said, I'm going to get ravens. See, y'all have to know about ravens. Ravens are carrion eaters. They eat rotting flesh. And so he says, I'm going to have buzzards feed you. (laughs) We got to talk, God. If you trust God, you're okay with buzzards bringing you food. Okay, see, because God has a way of working his divine bakery. Okay, see, because it says that the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. God says, you don't have a refrigerator, so I'm not going to bring it to you in the morning and have it left out all day. I'm going to bring it fresh to you. And you know what? I need to figure out how those ravens bake bread. Don't we have an awesome God that ravens can bring fresh bread? And you're worried about your little situation. (laughs) Oh, how is this going to happen? God says, don't I feed the birds? Don't I take care of all these other situations? Why in the world are you worrying about this? Why are you up at night? I'm up. (sighs) My wife says that I went in last night. She was still trying to get ready for bed. And I found one of my recliners. She came in to check on me, and she says, everything was quiet except the noise I make when I go to sleep. Okay. I'm, I'm a snorer. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, but, I'm, but I'm an industrial strength snorer, you know. <laughs> not, <laughs> not that. <laughs> the window shake. <laughs> God always has a bigger purpose. Sometimes the pain is punitive. Sometimes God is trying to spank your behind. Sometimes God is trying to tell you, you are in a place where you have no business being, and I'm going to dust you up so that you will know that this is not a place you should stay. Sometimes pain is therapeutic. Sometimes we get so relaxed. Sometimes God will hurt you. God is telling me through my wife, I've been eating a lot of sweets lately. And for my for our anniversary, I had a wedge of key lime pie from Ralph and Cackleman. Okay, great big piece, you know. But to be to be cruel, I cut it in half and ate the other half at home. <laughs> <laughs> I know better. And I think that God if I'm not careful, will send me a clear message that you have no business doing this. Those of you who are diabetic, you know what you're supposed to eat. You know what you're supposed to do. And then sometimes God will give us a dry place because it's the only place he can meet us. Sometimes it's the only time we'll be still. Sometimes it's the only time that we are prepared to listen to him. So he says, go to the brook. He says, I'm going to feed you. And then I'm going to test you. He says, I'm going to let your very provision that I gave you run out. And then I'm going to send you to someone who is worse off than you. Because I want to prove to you that I can take care of you and them. So sometimes God is using you in your poverty to be a blessing to us. You know how sometimes we say, but I, I scarcely have enough for myself. How can I let you have $5? You know what that says? I have a small God. You begrudge the $5 that you have. Because you think somehow you were the one who came up on it. 
If you realize that the five dollars that you have came from him, there's no problem giving it to somebody else because you have the same source that the five dollars came from to get another five dollars if you need it. But the faith that you display will tell you, hey, you're not a five dollar girl, you're a 25 dollar girl because you took the five you had and you gave it away. But we never get there. Okay, so the second point that I want to make is we can praise God in a dry place when we know that every plan works according to God's purpose. Look at verse 2. He says, the word of the Lord came to him saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. It will be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Kareth which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. How many of you know Romans 8, 28? What does Romans 8, 28 say? Anybody? Okay, so, 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 the one thing is that, that, that uh, Moses, that's almost right. Okay, that's good, that's good, that's almost right. Okay, what we, t- what we like to think is all things work together for the good of those who love God. That's not, that's not what it says. Okay, you got, to, you, got, you got to put God in there. Okay, God causes all things to work together for the good. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that God is not going to keep you out of a dry place. So you need to have some dry place clothes. <laughs> you need to have some clothes that you can wear in a dry place. And you need to be preparing your appetite not to eat as much as you normally eat. See, some of us, we can't be in a dry place because they don't serve ribs in the dry place. Don't shout me down now. I See, I know some of y'all are expert grillers. And so you had ribs, you had sausage, you had chicken, you had pulled pork, you had it all. It ain't dry there. Okay, but we know a dry place. We know a dry place. Elijah was in a dry place and God said, you go there, but I have a plan for you. And one of the things that you have to understand about God's plan is that God's plan is sovereign. Do you know sovereign? Sovereign means God can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to, however he wants, with whomever he wants. So there are some people who wonder why Pastor Smith's marriage lasted 49 years and man, mine lasted nine months. I can't answer that question. All I can tell you is that God has a plan. Because maybe the plan is that you weren't ready. And so he has something better for you. Maybe it means that you weren't supposed to be married in the first place. Maybe he's trying to show you how difficult it is. Do y'all know how difficult marriage is? Y'all see me standing up here? You gotta say, well, he looked pretty good. Okay. Y'all want me to show you the marks? <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, of course. You, you have to understand that if you are not prepared for the most difficult thing that you're ever going to do in your life, and that if it's about you at all, But God planned it that way. Nothing but Christians can stay married. You either have to be married to one. Okay, let me speak to the Christians who are married to non-Christians. Let's pause for a word of prayer. That's, That's about what we can do for you. Because the challenge is there. That doesn't mean that some people who are not believers aren't sweet people, but you're not going to see things from the same point of view. You're not going to have the same values, and you may be forced to compromise. 
That's why God says, don't marry, if you're a believer, don't marry someone that's an unbeliever. If you're already married, stay there. Ooh. Stay there. Why? Because God is sovereign and he's also providential. God was the one who arranged those birds. They came because God says, okay, now go feed Elijah. And then he was also maintaining the level of the brook. He says, okay, brook, time for you to dry up. And then he gave Elijah a different set of instructions. He says, you went to the brook and you obeyed. Now I'm going to send you to the woman. Okay, let's look at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there because I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. First he commanded the birds. First he commanded Elijah to go. And then he commanded the birds. And now he's commanding the widow because he's already spoken to her. Elijah hasn't met the woman. God has already spoken to the woman. Just like your relief, God has already lined it up. Let me see your hand if you're looking for a job. Okay. I, what I need to tell you is that God already has your job. What you need to do is you need to keep pressing till the door opens. They cannot keep the door closed on your job. They cannot keep the door closed on your opportunity. But the problem is we quit. We say, oh, I've, been try I I've sent out um, 60 resumes and I didn't get one response. Well, maybe the response comes on 61. So I sent out 100 resumes. Maybe the response comes on 101. Maybe what you have to realize is the job you're trying to get, God has no intention for you to get that job. I remember the last time that I looked for a job, I struggled. I struggled, I struggled, and finally I had the job in my grasp. And all I had to do was answer the questions that the psychologist was feeding me. Because they, they do a psychiatric exam to make sure you are fit. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm the final of two, I'm two, final two candidates, and he's interviewing me. We, do, we go an hour and a half. They fly him into Dallas from out of town. And then he gets down to the final two questions, and he says, what was the biggest shortcoming you ever had in your life or career? I said, my biggest shortcoming was I didn't realize how important family was, and I needed to make it a priority in my life. He looked at me, and his eyes kind of raised. He said, well, I got one more question. He says, so what's your biggest success? He says, I, I said that I figured it out in time um, so that my family is intact. He looked at me, he said, you know you're not going to get this job. Don't you? <laughs> I see, yeah, I, I sort of surmised that. I said, but I refuse to give you your answers for me. I said, the God that I serve, if this job is for me, you can't keep it. And if it's not for me... I can't have it. And what I didn't know, what I didn't know was that that was, that was um, um, October. What I didn't know is that I had been to Grambling State University and I had met a guy there. And I had given him my resume. And as soon as God closed that door, they said, well, you know, the other guy's going to get the job. Then I get the call from the guy I met at Graham, he said, you're still looking for a job. I said, holy Jesus, I'm still looking for a job. <laughs> he, he says, well, I may have something for you. I said, well, who do I need to talk to? When, when do I? When do? He says, settle down. He said, this is all taken care of. 
okay. Do you understand that God has already taken care of it? You need to calm your anxiety. You need to stop trying to help God. God had already talked to the widow woman. He had already told her that you need to give this prophet some bread even though it's the last of what you have because I'm going to use it to bless you and to bless him because I want you to learn how to praise your way through. We are, we're too hung up on, on seeing God move in our life. We, we are not, we are not okay with, with it being in a cloud or something we can't see. We're going to get our diagnosis, right? And we're in, we're in the waiting room and we're tense. I can tell you that I've sat in that waiting room waiting for the doctor to give me the assessment. Okay, and I'm thinking, how bad can this be? And then all of a sudden I realize it can't be any worse than God allows it to be. And if he has allowed me to be sick, he has already got a treatment program. So, so he allowed me to get cancer, but he already had 43 radiation treatments already lined up. And he knew that that would be the remedy, but he didn't stop me from getting cancer. He didn't stop me from going through it. He said, boy, I want you to learn how to praise me in dry places. See, and I was sitting next to people who were getting radiation for worse cancer than mine. And so I had a chance to talk to them and to encourage them and to help them find their praise. Because what happens is when you get into a dry place, your praise muscles atrophy. You, you, you just start having pity parties and you start feeling sorry for yourself. And God is saying, I'm here. I never left. I still got it. Why don't you praise your way through? So, 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 so y'all simmer down. God, God sent birds. And then this widow, listen to, he says, I love this part. He says, so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and he says, please get me a little jar of water that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, bring me a piece of bread. In her hand. He knew she didn't have no bread. <laughs> when you ask folk to give you what you know they don't have. You are putting your trust not in them, but in the one who provides for them. So he said, give me, bring, give me a little piece of bread. She said, I don't have no bread. She said, all I have is a little flour and a little oil. And I'm already going to make a cake for me and my son. And we're going to eat it, and then we're going to die. Sometimes. When you're in a dry place, you just don't think you're coming out. Because you're so busy looking at what you don't have. I mean, you got a God who is able to do more than you could ever ask or think. And all you are doing is you're looking at the little flour that you have left. You're looking at the little oil that you have left. And you say, I can't make it. And he's saying, no, you can't make it. He says, but I got you. He says, I can make it. Don't you know that I own the cattle of a thousand hills? Don't you know that I don't mind selling a cow every now and then when you have a need? So he's building faith in the woman who doesn't have anything. He says, bring me a little cake. And then make one for yourself. And for your boy, wait a minute now. Wait, Elijah. I don't have enough for us. And you telling me to make one for you and then one for me and one for my boy. And we were going to share one. Sometimes when God gives you something ridiculous to do, you just have to go ahead and act a fool. You remember David? 
David was so happy that the ark was coming into the city and his wife was watching him, trying to see if he was going to comport himself like the king, if he was going to be dignified. If he was, and then David took off his robe and all he had was his linen garment and he was out there in front of the folk and he was dancing. His wife said, what is wrong with him? Has he taken leave of his senses? No, David had come out of a dry place. And when God brings you out, he doesn't have to coax praise. Somebody in here has already been delivered from cancer. Somebody in here has already survived a bad marriage. Somebody in here has already seen their marriage put back together. Someone has endured the fact that they lost a loved one and they thought not life was never going to be all right. And here you sit and you are blessed and you need to praise him right now. You, you not wait. And so she made... She made the cake. See, all she did was the, she was just stupid enough to make the cake and give it to the brother. He didn't go in there and say words over it. He didn't touch it. He didn't do anything. He just said that the, that the flower bowl never got empty. And the jar of oil never ran out. Do you serve that kind of God? Do you serve the kind of God who can take you right in your dry? See, some of y'all are in a real dry place right now. Some of you are a caregiver, and it's wearing you out. Some of you are parents, and you got sick children. Some of you are working two or three jobs, trying to make ends meet. Some of you are so busy being busy that you don't have time to spend with him. He's saying to you, I miss my time with you. If you have to go to work at 5 o'clock, you get up at 4 o'clock and you spend some time with him. It'll make that Central Expressway drive smooth because you'll know he's already gone ahead of you. He's at your job waiting to welcome you in. He's already working your boss for the raise that you have not been able to get. He's already making a parking place so that someone, have y'all ever noticed some of you, sometimes you, 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 you're in a hurry and then all the parking places are taken and, and, you, and you make a circle and just right up at the front, it just seemed like somebody pulled out and all you do is you slide right in and you say boy was I lucky boy was I lucky and God had already reserved that spot before you ever left the house but you don't even have the decency to say thank you for my parking place if you if you take if you if you learn how to thank him for your parking place then you'll learn how to thank him for the check you got you, you ever sometimes get a refund? I, 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 I got some coffee I didn't like. I'm closing now. I got some coffee I didn't like. and I. Got, by the way, I'm going to be an Amazon customer for the rest of my life. Okay, I'm, a, I'm just going to tell y'all right now. And the coffee was not as good as I had hoped it would be. But they had already said, you don't have to send it back. Just call us. Okay, and we'll send you some more. Or we'll give you your money back. So I, somehow I got messed up. And, and before I knew it, they had ordered, reordered what I just got. And I thought, I don't want this. And then before I, by the time I could talk to somebody, the guy said, oh, I'm sorry. We can't cancel the order. It's already been shipped. I said, I talked to somebody 10 minutes ago. You're telling me the order has been shipped? <laughs> he said, yeah, it'll be there this evening. I said, now I'm going to have two boxes of coffee that I don't want. He said, I said, but I want the other kind. And, and we got a mistake here. He said, well, let me see. What, this is Dwayne. He said, let me see what we can do. He says, how about if I refund your money, you keep the two boxes, you do whatever you want with them, and then use the refund to buy the coffee that you want. I said, Dwayne, that'll work. That'll work. 
He says, well, well, within the hour, you have your refund in your account. It wasn't even 10 minutes. And I looked, and my $33 was back in my account. You know, and, I, you know, and, and so, so my first thought was, praise the customer service at Amazon. But then I realized that I am a king's kid. I realized that God was in that from the beginning. And even though it was only $33, and even though it was only about coffee, he was looking out for me. Well, I wish I had a praying church. I wish that you understood that dry places are coming, but you don't need to lose your praise. You praise him right through the dry place. We got some people here who've been in dry places, some of them still in dry places. Pray for Andrea Smith. She's in a dry place right now. She needs the prayers of the saints. But guess what? If she doesn't lose her praise, if she does not let her praise muscles atrophy, she's going to be just fine. We can praise God in a dry place because we know that his provision is more than adequate for our predicament. God is able. God is able. And, 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 and church, I, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We, we, our country has gone crazy. Okay. okay. People went to drain the swamp, and they made it bigger. Okay. But that's okay. Because God is not on vacation. You know, everybody worried about, you know, what if they do this? And what if they do that? Don't you realize that Satan has been loosed. Satan is loose in the world. Okay, but guess what? He's on a leash. <laughs> Did you hear me? You don't have to worry about him because he's on a leash. And so he might put his mouth right up to yours and blow his nasty breath in your face, but he can't get to you because as soon as he gets close enough to hurt you, he said, whoa, I got that boy. So, so, so don't stop reacting to the breath of the devil because the breath can't hurt you. He said, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. But, but you have to stop throwing pity parties. You have to stop feeling sorry for yourself. And you have to say, right here and right now, I'm just going to praise my way through. I'm through. I'm through. I'm through. And, and next week I'm going to talk about Elijah and how after a great victory, God, God built him up. God built him up. And he was ready to go to war. But the fact is that some t he forgot that it was God. He forgot it was God. And so after he vanquished the 450 prophets of Baal, after he, after he had had this great victory on Mount Carmel, he ran all the way to Jezreel. And then he was hungry, and he was tired, and then he fell into a depression. People, depression is real. And if you're trying to be married in your own strength, it'll give you a depression if you're trying to parent in your own strength, it'll give you a depression. If you're trying to make it on a job that's unfriendly to you, if you try to do that in your own strength, yes, Lord. you'll burn out. Amen. And you'll say, I just can't go on. Yes. But when you realize who you are and whose you are. Yes. Yes. See, I'm going to close with this illustration. Then I'm through. I'm through. I promise I'm through. I've given, I've told y'all this before, but see, y'all, y'all don't listen, okay? I, sometimes I do the laundry at home, and, and I look in the laundry, in the water after I, it's going, and it's just dark in there, dirt all in the water, and I'm wondering how in the world can I keep the dirt from getting back on the clothes. But the people who made the detergent had already figured that out. See, because in a detergent, what detergents do 
is they, when, they, when it washes the dirt loose, it surrounds the dirt with a little capsule. And that, and that the, the dirt can stay in the water, but it never gets back on the clothes. And when the rinse cycle comes, it just goes all down the drain because he's captured that dirt and washed it away. See, that's the way, that's the way forgiveness works. See, see, you, you all dirty and God sends his blood and he washes you and he cleanses you, but there's still a whole bunch of stuff. And so what he does, he just surrounds that so no more can get. You say, but I still, I'm not what I used to be. He's got that. Oh, he says, all you have to do, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all. That's how it works. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you're not covered by the blood here today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to invite you